My name is Mina Demian. I'm uh, part of the organizational committee here at St. Mina Coptic Orthodox Church. I'd just like to welcome you all here. Um, first of all, um, thank you so much for Dr. Chance for actually choosing St. Mina Coptic Orthodox Church. He's the uh, chair of Christian thought at the University of Calgary. Um, he's actually the one who approached us to uh, have this wonderful lecture here. So we're actually very excited to uh, have this lecture. And hopefully, this will be uh, first amongst many. So um, we actually uh, this is a brand new church. We just opened up in November, so we haven't even been open a year yet. So hopefully, again, we want to have uh, so much more lectures like this. So. Um, I also uh, would just like to say, uh, like to announce uh, the chair of Christian Thought myself. Um, um, Dr. Chance has been the chairholder of the chair of Christian Thought at the university since 2005. Um, just a little brief kind of synopsis. He's got a PhD in history from the University of Waterloo. Uh, he's also been a professor at several major universities and colleagues in Canada. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chance. Thank you, Mina, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to St. Mina Coptic Orthodox Church, and a special thank you to Father Agathon, who is with us this evening, uh, for your gracious hospitality. Um, this is a unique event. Uh, we are pleased to, to welcome Dr. Rembus Boutros from Toronto. Uh, he's a lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern and Middle Eastern Studies, U of, U of T. He has also taught at St. Paul Theological Seminary in Mississauga, which is an Orthodox seminary. Uh, his PhD is from Strasbourg, or Bach University in Strasbourg, with a focus on medieval history and archaeology of Christian Egypt. And interestingly, he has a diploma as well in Coptic archaeology and architecture. He's published many articles. His research areas are Coptic architecture and archaeology, monastic architecture and archaeology, women's monasticism, uh, pilgrimage sites, so he is well qualified for the topic this evening. Uh, we're going to have the usual program this evening. Uh, Dr. Boutros will lecture for about an hour, and then there will be a chance for you to ask questions. Um, the events that the chair hosts, such as this one, have an academic flavor to them. The purpose is to bring the insights of religious studies to the community. So, uh, just so you're prepared, right, for what's, for what's happening. Dr. Boutros is lecturing tomorrow as well at the University of Calgary uh, at 12.30. And uh, so you have an opportunity to hear him as well when he talks about women's monasticism. How many of you have attended one of these Christian chair events before? Would you raise your hand? It's great to see. Um, this is the fourth. This is the fourth and final of this academic year. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, I'll have a green sign-up sheet available near the uh, refreshments uh, at the end of this lecture. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Dr. Boutros to come, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shantz. I would like to first thank Father Agassin and congratulate him for this wonderful church and also for uh, hosting this lecture and his uh, gracious uh, hospitality. I, uh, I thank also Mina because he is the dynamo behind this uh, activity also for the church. And he has done the, like the coordinator between the university and the church. So uh, I encourage him to do more for the community. And um, special thanks, of course, to my colleague Anne Moore and, uh, and again to Dr. Shans for facilitating my coming here and putting all the like, financial means to cover my trip and all that. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here tonight and uh, to see all this attendance present for just, just eager to learn about Coptic culture and, uh, and 
particularly with this tradition, the Coptic or the flight of the Holy Family uh, to Egypt. Um, before I uh, just start into the subject, can, can anyone tell me why Jesus went to Egypt? Just very quickly. Like you got 10 seconds. <laughs> Popcorn. Yes? Uh huh. Uh huh. Something else? Yes, this is, this is what we learn from the scriptures, right? From Matthew's gospel. But uh, what is behind the story? Okay. The 10 seconds are <laughs> gone now. <laughs> I have to start. I think I will. This is the point or the question that I wanted to raise here tonight. And uh, I would like to highlight, in fact, three aspects of the tradition uh, that you see here on the screen. Uh, the event that we learned about it from uh, the Gospel, Matthew, and locations, locations built by, from the itinerary of the journey itself, and the commemoration that was done by the Copts themselves, like the Coptic Church itself, or uh, the, the people. So I will try to illustrate each of the three aspects uh, throughout the presentation of some literary evidence and uh, archaeological uh, evidence. So let me start with the event. The closest uh, uh, written source um, to the time of the event is the Gospel of Matthew. We all know that. Uh, in chapter 2 from verses uh, 13 uh, to 15, as you see on the screen, is divided into three sec sequences. First, Joseph's dream, and then second is uh, escape to Egypt, and uh, 15, uh, sorry, the, the third point, starting from verse 15, the fulfillment of the uh, prophecy. So Matthew is trying to, uh, very quickly we get this impression that this happened to fulfill the prophecy. That's a very important issue in the theology of this uh, tradition that was uh, like adopted by the early uh, Egyptians or the early church fathers uh, uh, of Alexandria. And I'll give you later on some examples that we know from uh, the sources. So Egypt became a second holy land uh, that will compete with Jerusalem. And this idea also, after the uh, evolution of the tradition itself, we, have this, we get this impression from all the homilies and the sermons that were attributed to uh, ecclesiastical figures of the Coptic Church. Now, this, uh, uh, this part of the uh, scriptures had an influence on uh, or repercussion on art. As we see here, a limestone block coming from um, Probably, we don't know exactly where in Egypt, but it's now kept in the Landes Museum in Mainz in Germany. And it has been dated approximately to the 6th, 7th uh, century. So we see on that limestone, uh, Joseph laying down on a bed here, and an angel, a huge angel in the center. Uh, you see the wings here in the back and holding uh, in his, uh, on his arm uh, a, a child. So that's probably depicting uh, uh, the idea of the, the vision to uh, Joseph when he appeared to him and told him, 
uh, get up and, and go take the, the child and the mother and go uh, to Egypt. In the art also uh, of wall paintings, we have examples like um, a church in Middle Egypt in a place called Deir Abu Hennes, south, located south of Armenia, some 300 kilometers south of Cairo. Also depicting a, the cycle of um, this flight to Egypt. Uh, in the center here, uh, it, the, the paintings are uh, very mutilated. They, are, they have been like uh, destructed in, uh, through the ages, but you have to trust me when I tell you this is Joseph and that's. <laughs> uh, at, at least the person who documented this painting, he, uh, he also uh, uh, inscribed or copied the names uh, usually uh, of the persons written above their heads. So here we have Yusuf, so that's Joseph behind and Mary uh, in the uh, on the, uh, the back of uh, um, an ace or donkey and uh, Jesus, unfortunately. Uh, we see part of his uh, cloth here. And um, here in the middle we have Joseph uh, in the dream and the angel. And on, on that side we have another part of uh, another scene. The second uh, part of the gospel that is also that had a repercussion in the art is the, the massacre of the innocents from very early in Egypt. From in Matthew 16:21, we know that when Herod realized that uh, uh, he had been uh, outwitted by the, the Magi, he was furious and so on. And again, there is another prophecy about uh, uh, this time from Jeremiah. A voice is heard in Rama about the weeping women, uh, weeping about the slaughter of their children. And then uh, the, the second dream after Herod died, so that's the end of the story, like uh, after they fled to Egypt, uh, stayed there. So Matthew, he, uh, he doesn't give us a lot of details about what happened in between, that, um, details about the journey itself. He's just saying that at the end, he appeared again to Joseph, told him that Herod died in the year uh, 4 BC, and, uh, and he went back to, um, they went back to Nazareth. So the same, uh, in the same church, their Abu Hennes, uh, south of Armenia, on the same walls also we have uh, a depiction of the slaughter of the, or, or the massacre of the innocent and you can see here soldiers uh, holding children from there. It's a horrible scene and, and uh, Herodotus, is, his name is above his head, he's sitting here on a, on a throne. And then we have the uh, in the Old Testament, we had those different uh, prophecies that we know about and that also are linked to the story of um, or the account of the flight to Egypt somehow because they come back again in the literary sources, in the sermons, in the, uh, even in, sometimes in the hymns. We have parts of uh, the fulfillment of all those um, uh, prophecies of Isaiah, of uh, Hosea, the, uh, call, uh, out of Egypt I called my son and um, uh, there will be an altar in, for the Lord in the heart of Egypt and, and a monument to the Lord and so on. Now the locations, this is the second point uh, of my uh, talk is the locations, the itinerary that was kind of reconstructed by the Coptic Church in, let's say, in, in our contemporary times. Partially reconstructed also in the medieval sources, like in the history of the patriarchs, we have brief lists of the locations. 
and also in some other sources. So we, we know, and, and of course, in the homilies or uh, uh, literary sources, speaking about the, the flight itself, we have names of locations. So we can, with all that, I'll show you at the end two tables with the different uh, locations uh, uh, all over the ages. Now, this is a, a kind of a recent map or a modern map uh, uh, approved by the Coptic Church as the itinerary that the Holy Family would have taken coming from, we have to imagine that Palestine is here and coming from the eastern uh, border of Egypt, al Arish and crossing to a place called Al-Farama, uh, the ancient Pelusium, uh, Greek name is Pelusium, and then going to the uh, edge of the delta and then going down a little bit and then going up to Samanud, to Sacha, maybe to Wadi Natrun, Skatis, place called Skatis in the, the old name, and then down to uh, Heliopolis, Matarea, and Cairo is supposed to be here, and then Babylon, and then from there they'll cross uh, to the other side of the Nile, the western side. And they will go down to here to a, pl a place called Oxyrhynchus, which is an, a Greek, ancient Greek uh, uh, town, an important town in Middle Egypt. Cross the Nile again to a place called Gabal el Ter, the Bird's Mountain, in uh, very close to a Roman town called Acoris, some five kilometers north of Acoris. And then crossed again and to uh, going through El Ashmunin or Hermopolis, Hermopolis Magna. And then to Deir el Muharraq, which is the ultimate, the last, uh, the most southern point they reached. Uh, of course, there are other new, more newer traditions saying that they went further north, south to another site called Deir Duronka, uh, uh, but we don't have any mention of that site in the uh, ancient sources. So this, this is roughly the, this, the itinerary. What we can see immediately uh, from that list that there is some important uh, ancient Egyptian towns or centers where the big temples and uh, the ancient Egyptian, uh, even during the Roman period, the ancient religion was still functioning. And like this site, Bubastis, it's a, a very ancient Egyptian town. Samanud, Sebenitos, Saha also. Wadi Natrun, uh, it was also exploited by the, by the Egyptian for the, the niter assault, but later on it became a monastic site. Heliopolis, an ancient Egyptian uh, town or center. Um, El Bahnasa, Oxyrhynchus, again, another ancient uh, town, and Hermopolis Mamna. So they are going, they go through also uh, those big center for the uh, Egyptian religion. That's an, uh, the first uh, observation that I wanted to highlight now. Now, we have to imagine also that go back to this time. Uh, Egypt became Roman from 30 BC and very quickly, because it's uh, an important province, province of the Roman Empire, it had to be linked to the other parts of uh, to the other provinces of Africa, uh, uh, especially the uh, Cyrenaica and uh, Mauritania and uh, Tingatina, which is Morocco, the actual Morocco, and here it's Algeria, and Libya is Cyrenaica, the actual, uh, sorry, Libya, and that's Tunisia. So all these parts of the provinces are, had to be linked with roads, ancient roads, uh, the, red, the red line is indicating the, the major road. So you, as you see, the empire is all 
linked together with a, a very dense network of roads for the ease of moving from one place to another, moving the forces, moving the goods for the travelers. And those roads were controlled. Uh, they had a police on those roads, and everybody who was traveling on those roads had to also show kind of like passports or uh, something called a laissez passe, like a permit or permission to travel from one place to another. So if we're talking about somebody coming from, uh, from Bethlehem, from uh, Judea, or crossing uh, into Egypt, uh, they had to either take the main road or stay outside the road but close to it because it's, it's also close to the main centers or main stopping points where they, ca they could get water and food and so on. That's a detail of that map just to show you uh, this road was called Via Maris. Via Maris because it's a, a coastal road. It's on the, the Mediterranean and it went, it used to go to like uh, Memphis or a little bit north of Memphis. Memphis was the ancient capital of uh, Egypt during the pharaonic periods. And if on the western side of uh, the delta going through Alexandria and then uh, launching the, the coastal, uh, the coast of the Mediterranean. Now I'll show you some slides to show you the remains, the archaeological remains that um, have been found on those sites like in a place, the first stop here is El Farama Pelusium. It's a uh, ancient city uh, that was also, that existed, functioned even during the pharaonic period, but during the Roman times they built uh, fortresses and during the, later on of course, uh, during the Byzantine uh, period or when Egypt became Christian, uh, some, we see uh, some huge churches like this one is a huge basilica with uh, 14 meter in the span between the columns in the center. So it's really a, a very important uh, building on the road. Of course, at the, at the time when, uh, supposedly when the Holy Family came through, there was, no, uh, there was only a Roman uh, fortress at that, at that time. That's just a map show the location, Pelusium. <coughs> And then they moved to, uh, towards the, the delta to Tel Basta, where um, here you can see the ruins of the ancient Egyptian temple of Tel Basta, or from granite. And then a few years ago, they discovered the, the antiquity service, they discovered a well, a Roman well, and uh, very quickly the, it has been like attached to the uh, to the story or to the, the account of the Holy Family because in the sources we have mentioned about they, they, had, they stopped at, the, at, at this place and they needed water and they didn't get water and so on. So they said this, is, this well is the Holy Family uh, uh, or Jesus uh, created this well when uh, they refused to give him water. Uh, Semen Nud, further east, uh, west, sorry, in the delta. Coptic church now dedicated to St. Mary and Apa Nub, the martyr. And uh, this, there is a, a local tradition saying that this present church replaced an ancient church. So there is underneath the actual one, there, there was uh, another one and of course, uh, when they stopped digging and they found some interesting uh, ancient material that was also uh, added to the, like a sacred element of that place, like this bowl you see here in the middle and people, the pilgrims, they, they, they touch or they take holy water from it uh, when they visit the church. The Secha, it's also uh, 
one of the uh, stops and you will see later in the, in the sources that one of the bishops, the, in, the old bishops from the 6th or 7th century um, is, uh, is, a, is author of uh, one of those homilies I talk about, the homilies the speaking about the, the flight to Egypt. So here you can see in the middle of that picture of uh, the father of that church and he's pointing at a stone that was discovered in the 80s, uh, in I think 1985, and showing a, 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 f a footprint of supposedly, as they say there, they claim that this is the footprint of uh, Jesus when he was a child, when he came to Egypt. Now, Wadi Natrun is not, uh, does not appear in all the uh, old sources. And some, of, some sources, they agree that they went to Wadi Natrun. As you see, it's really a very far uh, detour in the desert. And some others, they say they just blessed it from far. So we don't have a, a very exact account of did they go or did they not go. However, it's, uh, it became, the Wadi Natrun became uh, one of the most uh, uh, important monastic centers in the world, even I would claim. Uh, from a very early time, from let's say from the, um, the early first century with um, St. Macarius, he founded a uh, uh, a community, a monastic community there, and then it grew bigger and bigger. And also, Saint Anthony had contacts uh, with the monks there, so the monasticism grew bigger and bigger in that area. That's very not true. Um, and then, uh, we, if you go down to uh, to that area. Uh, close to Cairo, Matareya, which is the ancient Heliopolis, they say that the Holy Family found shade under a sycamore tree, and uh, Jesus created a well, and also Mary used the water of the well to bathe Jesus. He, Jesus uh, took some uh, like small branches and planted them again, and it gave balsam trees. So it, there was a lot of like manifestations of miracles attached to that site, the site of uh, Heliopolis. Here. Then more, more down southward is uh, Babylon. Uh, it's, it was an, a, a Roman fortress a very small Egyptian locality in the ancient uh, pharaonic times. And then during the Roman times, the, they built um, a fortress there and, and um, probably, of course, after the time of uh, the flight to Egypt. And they, um, they say that uh, when, it, when Mary and Joseph and Jesus came to that place, there was kind of a crypt or a cave where they hide it for a few days and later on that site became a, a, a church uh, under the name of Abu Serga or Saint Sergius and Bacchus. They are both uh, office, uh, officers in the Roman army who were uh, martyred in, in Syria. So this church uh, in fact is was built uh, after the Arab conquest, so in the second half of the seventh century. We know that from uh, different historical uh, sources talking about its construction. And underneath the, sorry, what you see here is the crypt. This crypt is uh, 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 in underground or underneath the, the altar or the sanctuary. And it, it is the place, supposedly the place where they hide it, but not as it is built like that. It was a, a natural cave. And then later on, they built the church. And this became like a small uh, chapel underneath the, the church and still can be visited. 
Now, here in the picture, you see there is water, but uh, in the modern restoration, they pumped out the water and it can be visited. Oh, sorry. The, uh, this site is, um, now they, they will go down to a place uh, called Maadi, and they will cross the Nile from there uh, to, and they, they will stay on the western side of the Nile until they arrive to uh, Oxyrhynchus, where they also stayed a few days, and there there is a place called uh, Pai Isus. Pai Isus or Pai Isus means the house of Jesus. And or it was also altered to their their Bisus. And on that site, uh, we have also from that site we have a, a written tradition that I will show you um, later on in the uh, literary sources. Now, Gabal et Ter is a very uh, pittoresque site, uh, like a cliff, high cliff, and, and uh, before the construction of a high dam in Aswan that regulated the water flow to in the Nile, all those areas were like covered with water, and the water can would arrive to the uh, to the, the foot of the cliff, and in this uh, in this cliff there is there is a, a natural cave that was also um, they claim or they say that the holy family stopped here. There is a written tradition also about that site attributed to one of the Coptic church patriarchs and. Uh, and they say that they, they stayed here uh, three days uh, on that side. So the mountain was going to fall over there, but they were, they were like sailing in the Nile before arriving to the shore, and Jesus held the, the face of the cliff, and his hand was uh, like imprinted on the face. And from that came the name of the site, Gabal al kaf or the mountain of the palm hand, or the hand uh, print, hand, uh, hand print of, uh, of the child. And in the medieval sources, even in the Islamic sources, it kept this name, uh, Gabal al-Kaf. Or Gabal al-Kaf also. Kaf means the cave or crypt. So uh, it, either it was called Gabal al-Kaf, or the mountain of the cave, or the mountain of the uh, hand print and the mountain of birds because of an older uh, legend uh, about that site. So this site, to remind you again, is very close to um, an ancient uh, Roman city called Acoris. It's five kilometers north of uh, Acoris. Now, Gabal Kuskan uh, or Deir Muharak is really one of the, the high places for the, the story of the, or the, um, the tradition of the Holy Family, and it became one of the biggest also pilgrimages for Virgin Mary and to um, commemorate the, the memory of uh, the Holy Family. Or well, some people, they they say that because Asyut is in the middle uh, between um, the north of uh, Egypt and the south of Aswan, uh, so that is a kind of a, a fulfillment of the prophecy saying that there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Especially that there is also another uh, story that we learn from medieval sources that Jesus himself came after his resurrection with the, with the disciples and Mary, they came to that site and they uh, like blessed or consecrated an altar. And this is uh, supposed to be the first uh, altar or the first church built uh, in the whole world. So that, that is what you can hear when you go to uh, Muharraq or even in, uh, uh, you will learn that from the medieval sources. 
Now, the return to Palestine is very brief in all the sources. We don't know very much about uh, the route. They are very contradictory. Uh, some, uh, even, some sources even don't say anything about which side they went. They, they took the way on the eastern bank or the western bank. Uh, we don't have very much detail. However, we can see also uh, in some medieval sources uh, uh, traditions saying that they crossed to the eastern bank again. They, they even went to a site called their uh, Kusair. So that is uh, something also uh, not very, very uh, clear about that tradition. So the whole focus in is on the, the trip going into Egypt, but we, le we have less information about going out of Egypt. As it, some sources even say they, they flew on a, a, a cloud. <laughs> they went back to, they, ri they rode on a cloud and they went back to uh, Jerusalem, or, uh, so to Nazareth. It's not very uh, difficult to uh, believe that, of course. Now, there is a third part of, uh, let's take some water. Of my, my talk is about the commemoration, which is also a very rich part. Um, that is based mainly on the written sources and um, big variety of sources and, and of course the, the sites and the, all the sacred traces that I have started already to show you some of them like the block with uh, the footprint of uh, Jesus or sometimes even they say uh, footprints of Mary or Mary baked bread in that bowl or she based, uh, she gave a, a bath to the child in that basin or this tree bowed down in front of them when they came. So you have plenty, plenty of like um, not necessarily artifacts. You, you can have the building of a church itself is sac uh, like sa sacred by uh, by the local people and they consider it as a holy place blessed by um, being on the itinerary it has been blessed by the coming of uh, the Lord to Egypt. So this kind of uh, commemoration or uh, celebration for me I see it something continuous. It's not something that happened in the past and we are like uh, celebrating only a memory. Yeah, we are celebrating the memory of his coming to Egypt, but there is a kind of a, a continuous commemoration that is renewed all the time with uh, some new elements on the itinerary, some new churches, some new wells that add it to the, um, to the list. Um, let's check with the written sources. So we have three, those are like some examples. Uh, I'm not going into too much detail uh, because then it will become very boring for you. But just to give you an idea about what is the kind of sources uh, that the historians, they can use for, uh, to reconstruct the history of that tradition. The homilies, the sermons, and liturgical sources we have uh, also a Defnar, and which is an antiphonarium, uh, a book of hymns that the church uses uh, for the feasts of saints, and uh, the Synaxarium, which is the um, like a liturgical calendar of the Coptic saints, biographies of the life of saints that are also read for the day of their uh, feast. And then hymns, a variety of hymns. Uh, and the historical sources, Christian and Muslim sources, not only uh, Christian sources give us information about um, 
this tradition. So the first category, the homilies, or what we call the Mayamir, or coming from the word Maymar, Maymar means, uh, it's a Syriac word, means sermon. There are four homilies known in the Coptic Church and they were copied abundantly in manuscripts that can be found everywhere in Egypt or in all, especially in the big libraries the, of the ancient monasteries like in Wadin Natrun, in Scatis, uh, west of the Delta, or the monasteries of the Red Sea, uh, the monastery of St. Anthony and St. Paul. Uh, they hold uh, large collections, like 1,600 of manuscript, and also, of course, the, the patriarchal uh, library in Cairo, which has like 3,000 manuscript, and uh, even in sometimes in small churches in uh, in the Delta or even in Upper Egypt, you can find copies of those manuscript, and and uh, particularly the the tradition of the site itself. So we'll not, you will not find the four traditions, but when you go to Dar al-Muharraq, because this tradition is uh, related to Dar al-Muharraq, Gabal Kuskam, so you will find lots of copies of the uh, Maimar Theophilus. Uh, Timosaurus, some fragments were, were found in Gabal Tir. Syriacus, in Bahanasa, in Oxyrhynchus, and uh, Zacharias in the Delta in Saha. So three of those traditions are related to uh, sites in Upper Egypt and one, uh, only one site in the Delta. The first is uh, the Maimar or the, the sermon or homily attributed to uh, Theophilus. Uh, it's called the homily on the Mount of was come. Uh, Theophilus is the 23rd uh, patriarch of uh, the Church of Alexandria and uh, it was initially composed in Coptic and translated to Arabic but we do not have any Coptic fragment from that tradition so far. So we have Syriac, we have Ethiopian, Gaz, or Gaz, the, or, the, or the ancient Ethiopian, and Arabic, and so far, uh, no Coptic uh, text. So it's, uh, uh, it's a little problem for that uh, tradition so far. The oldest one is uh, this one now, it's in the Vatican Library. There is also another copy in the monastery that is unpublished, and this is the date of the translation is mentioned in that manuscript. So when you read that manuscript in Arabic, it says that it has been translated from the Coptic in that date. So we know already that a Coptic version existed in 1284. Now the memoir of Timoseus was unknown until uh, the early 90s and uh, I worked there on that site and I found the first fragments of uh, Arabic and then I found full versions of the Arabic and with a colleague we could identify Coptic fragments in Paris, in Pushkin Museum, in, uh, in Russia. So uh, uh, the, the collection, the, the manuscript was really kind of divided and it's not uh, even only one manuscript, it's different manuscripts, but we found only folios or parts of that manuscript in Coptic. So just to let you know that this is the only homily about the Holy Family that so far until today that has been found in Coptic. So all what we have, all the rest are all in Arabic. And of course it has been translated to uh, Syriac, uh, no, sorry, uh, to uh, uh, Arabic and Ethiopian. So we have also a good uh, text in the uh, in the Gaz, in the, the ancient. This is a view of their Gabalatir, which is a, a rock-cut tomb from 
the Roman period, the late Roman period that was converted to a church, adapted to a church, and it was probably built uh, towards the end of the fifth, uh, beginning of the sixth century. It's also one of the um, important uh, sites for the tradition of the Holy Family. The third tradition attributed to a bishop called Heriakos or Kyriakos uh, of Bahnasa uh, from the 6th, 7th century. And um, it was composed in Coptic and translated to Arabic. And we don't have any Coptic. We have only the Arabic uh, versions of that tradition. This is the actual church. It's a modern one. But we can still see in the village the ruins, architectural elements of the ancient, uh, of the ancient church, as you see here, this, this, uh, this capital and a, a fragment of a, a column. And then the delta, the delta, um, the tradition of the delta, attributed to uh, Zacharias, who was. Uh, Bishop of Xois or Sacha uh, at the end of the 7th, beginning of the 8th century. And uh, also the oldest version in Arabic, 1383, uh, Captain Abu Serga, the Church of Sergius and Bachos in uh, Old Cairo. And it commemorates the stay of the Holy Family in the area of Al Burullus, not at Sacha. So, uh, Bishop. Uh, Zacharias was bishop of Sacha, but this uh, the, the, the sermon is about another place that was destroyed uh, in was very important in the Middle Ages called Der el Maktas, and it has been not found yet the, any trace of the that monastery, and um, and th this is where also the the stone with the footprint of Jesus was probably there and it was hid in another moved to another place and discovered in 1985 that I mentioned at the beginning. Now just to um, I'm not trying to impress you here with all those tables and plenty of information but just if you have a, a, a quick look uh, uh, with the TS and TAI and TA2 and so it's crazy uh, all those uh, uh, abbreviations. Just um, to have a, a quick look, you will see that uh, some of those um, like uh, traditions, written tradition, Z is for Zacharias. It's the last homily I was talking about of the Delta. You see the growing number of the sites and when we start with the vision of Theophilus in the Syriac uh, language, uh, it was really, we have only two sites. Tel Basta, at the east of the delta, after Al Farama, they cross to Del Tel Basta, and then Hermopolis, Al Ashmunin, and Kuskam, Der El Muharak. So we don't have all those plenty of sites. And even in uh, a version of that uh, sermon that was published in a book at the beginning of the 20th century called. Uh, the book of the sermons and the miracles of uh, Saint Mary, Kitab Mayamir wa Ajab al Ladra. This this uh, version of the homily, you can see that it is uh, copying from different or is is an, a, a very recent version of the story, seeing that all that number of sites that has been added uh, on the way, or so during. Uh, through ages. Now, because I talked a lot about the Middle Ages, Middle Ages, I kept saying this word. Now I want to go back earlier. We have started with the event, event with the Gospel of Matthew. But what's after that? What happened to the story between, uh, we're talking about uh, traditions written starting from the 6th century, and uh, the event of the gospel first century. So what, what happened? We have a gap. We don't have very much information. But 
Fortunately, there is. There, is, there, there are small hints about uh, this tradition in some works, like, for example, uh, Clement of Alexandria, who was uh, the dean of the Catechetical School of Alexandria, the School of Theology, uh, founded by Pantinus in 180 AD. And uh, Clement, he wrote a work named Stromata, and in this work he speaks about uh, this date, which is a, a Coptic, Coptic date, Bashansis, a Coptic um, from the ancient Egyptian calendar. And the 24 Bashans is considered in the Coptic church as the date of the entry of the Lord in the land of Egypt. So he knows already uh, at the end of the second, beginning of the third century, he knows about this feast, Clement. Huh? And then we have uh, another information from Hippolytus of Rome, another theologian who wrote a commentary on Matthew. And in this uh, commentary, he mentions something about the Antichrist and the time of the Antichrist on earth will be, the length of that time will be three years and six months, exactly like uh, as long as the time Christ will or sorry, stayed in Egypt. So he knew already about, um, about that tradition. Just a, a note that saying that uh, Hippolytus, he was probably, he lived part of his life in Alexandria. He even followed the uh, uh, lessons or was he was taught uh, theology in the school of Alexandria. This is very obvious from his uh, style of writing and um, and and also uh, he he was very acquainted with some figures of that school like uh, Oregon uh, Oreganos who who was also another master of that uh, school so maybe he got he information or there was already some informations about that trip the coming of Jesus to Egypt and some details and how did he know this period from, uh, from his colleagues uh, like uh, Oregon? Other category, another category of sources also that is not negligible, but we have to uh, say that very frustrating, like also the, the early uh, sources. I just brought a few examples uh, from the, the early church writers and uh, the, the papyrology. Papyrology is a very uh, an accurate, uh, uh, accurate documents or accurate discipline for the information we get from it. This, this uh, papyrus has been found in uh, Fayum, in Fayum Oasis, west of uh, Cairo, in the Western Desert. And it speaks about also uh, the glorification to the land of Egypt, blessed by the dwelling of Jesus. So we're talking about the fourth, maybe maximum, the fifth century. And this idea of Egypt that was been blessed by or glorified by the coming of the Lord and staying three years and uh, 11 months. Of course, this does not, is not matching with what I said about Hippolytus and not with what the church, the Coptic church is uh, taking as a, um, the traditional duration of their time in Egypt. There is a slight difference, but also there is a difficulty. Uh, the translator of that text says that in the part where the date is mentioned, there is a, a difficulty in uh, the reading. So we can say maybe it is saying the same date or maybe not, I don't know or it can be also a mistake, that's not uh, impossible. So again, uh, still few hints. We don't have like elaborated texts like we will see later on. Until now, we just have few hints here and there, but the tradition is transmitted orally. We know that yeah? because of that, uh, those proofs in the writing of the uh, early uh, church fathers. Uh, one of the interesting um, narratives or um, 
books about Egypt. It's a, a, a travel guide um, that was written by seven monks, Palestinian monks, who visited Egypt uh, in between uh, 394 and 95. And it's called the uh, uh, Historia Monacorum, or the history of the monks in Egypt. Uh, we don't know who is the author from the seventh, so it's an anonymous author. They stopped uh, in Hermopolis, uh, Al Ashmonin. So here you see the picture of uh, the basilica, the Christian basilica of Hermopolis. And they say that they. They met someone there, Apollo is the founder of a monastic community there in a place called Bawit. They say within the limits of Hermopolis to which the Savior along with Mary and Joseph came fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. So this idea of first already in, in the monastic uh, milieu or the monastic centers the tradition was known, and this is what they got as an information when they went to this area and they went to that monastery and met Apollo. And they also uh, repeat what the people are saying or repeating, that the coming of Jesus to Egypt with Mary is in fulfillment of uh, this or that uh, prophecy from uh, the Old Testament. How much time do I have? Seven minutes? Yeah. Okay. Some other uh, historical text is uh, Suzumenos, is a church historian who uh, complemented the work of uh, uh, Eusebius, maybe? I'm not sure. But uh, he wrote a uh, church history, um, and he, say, he mentions that he visited Hermopolis in 439. And, um, and he said that this place, uh, Hermopolis, had a, uh, a tree that the Egyptians are venerating. Um, and they say that it has like uh, curative virtues and it can operate miracles. Uh, even the barks of the trees or small parts of the branches uh, taken or given to any sick person, they will be uh, cured. Also, also he mentions that it's maybe, he gives this interpretation saying that this uh, tree seemed to be also uh, something that is uh, worshipped by the Egyptians from the ancient times. And this tree uh, bowed down in front of uh, when Jesus and Mary uh, uh, Joseph came into the, the city. So some of the, the icons, like this one, you see they're drawing plants b bowing down uh, in front of uh, uh, the family, the Holy Family. Another uh, table, just to show you the medieval sources, historical and liturgical sources. We have History of the Patriarches, we have uh, a, a book written by an author named Abul Makarim, who gives a, a, a large list of uh, places um, as, as, as uh, stations on the, uh, the journey. And uh, we have the, the Arabic Synexarium gives less, less sites. And of course, sometimes we can use uh, the Ethiopian uh, Synexarium because m Lots of biographies are taken from the Copto Arabic uh, or the Arabic Synexarium. This is the result of um, what you can see today, uh, how many sites have been added to the, the, the journey. If we, we talked at the beginning, uh, Matthew didn't say anything, and then in the fourth, fifth century, we're talking only about Hermopolis, maybe uh, a couple of other sites, like Memphis also is mentioned by uh, some early uh, pilgrims who came to Egypt as being uh, one of the sites uh, over here. And then uh, later on and later on, you'll have more and more and more and more accumulate more sites. So until uh, you have a huge list with uh, 57 uh, sites. 
Now the holy traces that are venerated by the pilgrims, they can be churches, can be crypt, altars even, wells, trees, uh, stones with handprints, footprints, uh, basins, bowls used by Mary for preparing the food or preparing uh, bread. It can be even books like, I'll show you an example uh, in the south, uh, sorry, in uh, Ma'adi, in the south, uh, uh, south of Cairo. That's the, the, ca the, ca the cave church of Gabal the whole church itself, uh, because it's a, a rock cut church, it's considered, everything in the church is holy for the pilgrims. And the holiest place in that church is a cave, which the entrance to it is in this corner of the church crypt uh, of the church of Gabal there is uh, the crypt of the church of Abu Serga or San Sergius and Bacchus in Babylon. The altar of Der Muharak that was blessed uh, or consecrated by uh, Jesus and the disciples and Mary after the resurrection. Another altar board also that was found in Der Abu Hennes, uh, which was an, an old uh, altar that was reused during the Coptic period and it became even a uh, a tombstone and then reused in the altar. Uh, wells in other churches in the Delta, in a place called the Kadus. Uh, Tel Basta, uh, the tree, the sycamore tree of Matareya, Heliopolis, the footprint of Sacha, the, the bowl of Samanu. This book is, uh, was found in the 70s uh, in south of Cairo. It's a Bible and it was open on the verse of Isaiah, blessed be Egypt, my people. And it is put in the church also for, as a, a source of blessing for that uh, whoever comes to visit the church. So let me um, conclude. The, the journey of the Holy Family, uh, the Coptic tradition make them travel through the major ancient Egyptian cities in the Delta and all along the uh, the Nile Valley. Those cities were like strong upholds or centers of for the ancient Egyptian religion. So according to the early church writers, the Lord Jesus did not come to Egypt just to flee the Roman soldiers or to avoid uh, the violence uh, instigated by, the, by King Herod. Jesus has come to Egypt to abolish the pagan cults in fulfillment of all the prophecies of the uh, Old uh, Testament. He, ha he has come to plant a seed, and this seed will, we will see later on, will work, and, and Egypt will become uh, one of the most important Christian centers in that area. And by the way, it has the largest Christian community until now in the Middle East. So this idea of the fulfillment of the prophecies can be very well seen strongly in the writings of the uh, early church uh, fathers. And even in the four homilies, we can see also uh, that idea of fulfillment is coming again and again uh, um, a lot. Archaeologically and historically speaking, it's difficult to affirm what was the initial itinerary of the journey. Very difficult. You know. If we go, if you start from the gospel, we have no idea. Jesus, he says they went to Egypt, but where? We don't know. But uh, all along the century sites disappeared and others were added. So we know other sites, ruins of sites that uh, we learn about them from the ancient sources, but they are not uh, functioning today. So this, the same phenomenon is valid for the holy traces or the sacred objects. Those who disappeared were replaced to revive the, uh, the story continually and, and strengthen the face of uh, the Egyptians. It is sure that the tradition has started with oral narratives and uh, apart from all the scarce hints that I showed you in the early church uh, writers, uh, they, we, we don't have any solid uh, historical source before the fourth century. 
And um, at this time, Christian pilgrims and church historians die. They mention a limited number of locations with holy traces. No homilies for this period have been found so far, but they will be written uh, later on, starting from the sixth century, and they will even flourish more during the Arabic period. Muslims also used to go and visit uh, uh, those sites because they venerate Mary. The architecture of those texts is very similar. So you see that uh, the writers are uh, kind of copying or building their text. Uh, there is a style, there is a genre that they are applying uh, everywhere. They are attributed to ecclesiastical figures just to give them authenticity and, of course, more seriousness. And uh, this is uh, really um, something that uh, continued for a long time uh, until, of course, with the difficult periods of, in the history of the Coptic Church, we see a decline in the activity in the pilgrimage sites. And uh, today, I believe that, again, there is kind of a, a revival in a lot of those pilgrimage sites. They attract lots of visitors, and uh, there is more and more uh, activity in uh, especially the sites uh, related to um, uh, the Virgin Mary and the Holy Family. Um, this is my talk, and I thank you for your patience, and I'm ready for any questions. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. The Holy Family arrived here when he was about two. And they stayed with there three and a half three years. Three and a half years. So he was about five and a half or six when they left. Yeah. How oh, long? I don't know that area at all. In terms of distances, but it looks enormous. And you're walking. And you're walking. Mm -hmm. Joseph's walking. Yeah. You can't ride on the back of a donkey and be comfortable for a very long period of time. Yeah. So I can't imagine that long distance taking place. How many miles is that from when they get Let's say from, uh, from them to the border and then all the way from Egypt down to the bottom. How many miles is that? Just roughly. Um, About a thousand. Looks like yeah. a thousand. Yeah. Or well, maybe less, a little bit less, maybe. Close. Yeah, from really from the long, departure point, maybe one thousand. Really long distance yeah. to walk, and then to walk back with a slightly bigger child. <laughs> yeah, it's a little hard to, to imagine how that's done. You probably have no research in that regard at all. Like I said at the beginning. Uh, any scholar or any historian, he speaks with the sources. I mean, I started even with the Bible as, or the Gospel as my first starting point, and all the scholars who worked on that topic before, this is their starting point. We don't have details about the journey. I cannot give you more details, more than what I learned from the sources. Difficult to know, you understand? So we don't have, we don't know exactly, like I said, the route itself even is, we, we don't know. I showed you everything, like how the story was built and how it grew from its very beginning, from the time of Matthew, and then th going through the, like the church fathers, this very small hints. They don't say anything. They say, yes, the feast of 24 Sebastians. Okay, what else? They don't say, they don't give us details. So, frankly, we don't know, or I don't know, personally. If anybody knows anything, uh, share it with us. What, what was the, what part of Salome? I did my notes work. Salome? Yeah, 
Salome is a cousin of Mary, and she was a maid uh, uh, woman. She was with them, and that is only in the Coptic tradition. Salome doesn't exist in any uh, other traditions about the Holy Family. And if it exists, it's coming from translations of different sources, like the sermons or the, the gospel of infancy of Jesus. Uh, they were very popular in the Middle Ages, and they went to Europe. And from that time, you will see plenty of paintings Sculptures of depicting the Holy Family in Europe. Yes. I have a question in the back here. I'm just saying the uh, icon on the bottom. Yeah. There's Joseph on the left, and is it Salome behind him? Yeah. Okay. Oh no, it's uh, it's Jesus on his shoulder. I'm sorry, it's small, but uh, okay. yeah, sometimes uh, I didn't bring here an example, but uh, Jesus is shown. Uh, like the Egyptians, they carry their children uh, on their on their shoulder, one leg in the front and one in the back. Okay, the, the icon that was your introductory slide. Yeah, you want me to go back? The second one. I don't know if it's going to be difficult. No, the title slide, the very first one. Oh, uh, I just escape. It's in the church of Al Mu'allaqa, the, the, the suspended church in uh, Cairo, in a, in a big icon, and that's a detail in the big icon. Okay, the, the lady that's Salome. That's Salome. Okay. It's, she is not, she's not always depicted in the background, sometimes, and sometimes they appear without Salome. But in the older tradition, we have. Like in Bawit, we have, uh, Bawit is a monastery in Middle Egypt, uh, 30 kilometers south of Hermopolis. I spoke a lot about Hermopolis today, in Middle Egypt. So uh, in this monastery, from, um, it was established in the, the end of the 4th century and survived in the 9th century. So in a room from the 7th century, we have, um, we have uh, Salome in the scene. But it's not about... Uh, the trip to Egypt. It's in the nativity. So Salome is, was present there in the Egyptian story in the nativity. Yes. Yeah. They sailed on the Nile, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. They used boats also. Yeah. They weren't like walking all the distance. Yeah, there is part of the trip, not, not all of the, the time. But um, that's a good point because if you're coming from um, the eastern border, let's go to a map to, be, to speak. Oh, man. Sorry. Uh, Salome is here also, you see. She's talking to Joseph. <laughs> uh, I need to get the map to show you. Uh, yeah. So here, in the, during the pharaonic period, there was a, a branch of the Nile uh, from going from here, from the delta, to that area. So you could even sail in that branch, and this branch continued to function during the, the Roman times even. So it, was, it existed there. So maybe in some parts uh, of the trip, they, they took boats. Let's imagine that maybe they took boats from here. But then they have a problem because Tel Basta is on the edge of the desert. Maybe it's far from that branch of the Nile. But later on when they, uh, they went down, they maybe took some parts in, on, on the Nile. I don't know. It's difficult to know. Yes, but they uh, they were never presented in the iconography with camels. I, I have I have never seen 
Although the Western uh, iconography about the Holy Family is uh, more richer in the imagination than the Egyptians. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. That for the cops, eh? don't get upset. Uh, but but we, we, we never saw this like camel going on. Yeah, of the artist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Based on what he learned from a source. The artist, they read a book about the story and then they draw what they, they read. We do have a lot of questions, so let's just yeah. restrict ourselves to people who have uh, Professor Lucas, mm -hmm. a question about a text. The fourth century uh, vision of uh, Bishop Theophilus. Yeah. It, it was translated to Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Bad news eh, for you. Uh, oh, no. Uh, maybe, no, there is a version in English. One version is in, in, in Italian, and there is another version in English. I can't remember right now. Because the Arabic, um, may, there is a Syriac uh, version, and there is the Arabic version. Both are translated. One of them is in Italian, and one is, uh, I think, English. Yes. Professor, is there any reason given as to why they kept on the move other than staying in one or two places in Egypt? It's like somebody who is uh, trying to escape from something. Uh, but this is the, uh, his, they are trying to get as far as they can. But there is also another question that we can all ask ourselves. Why they didn't go to uh, Syria, uh, to Mesopotamia? To, uh, why they didn't go to Alexandria? There was, there was a, a large uh, Jewish diaspora. In, uh, or in Syria, in Antioch, there was also a large Jewish diaspora. You also said that they wanted to, they wanted to change the religions. Yeah. So yeah. Yes, this is a, a theological interpretation of, uh, and, and the fathers, the early fathers, they, they highlighted that. Especially, uh, I think uh, Eusebius of Caesarea is the first one who, who gave this uh, interpretation uh, to the journey. Yeah, this is what we learn from the homilies. Yeah, the homilies they always say that they are like escaping because uh, uh, even in the homily of the Theophilus, they say that uh, a cousin of Joseph came, especially from uh, from Palestine, to warn him that the soldiers are still looking for him, and then he died there and he was buried in in uh, Dar Muharraq and so on. Yes. Perhaps my question is related also to the discussion about why Jesus did not stay in one place during his visit. Um, my question is, I've heard, and I don't know how true or how uh, substantiated are these statements by any archaeological facts, that whenever he, uh, the Holy Family went into a big center mm. that's full of the temples, yeah. Mm. Everything was destroyed. Yeah. And all the temples fell down yeah. and were demolished. Is there any archaeological uh, findings to assess to that? And this is probably one of the reasons that they were hated so much by the Egyptians yeah. at that time and they were persecuted to the point where they had to travel so much. Yeah. One thing I'll answer right away first, they were not persecuted everywhere. According to the written sources, they were welcomed in many places, but sometimes persecuted in others or badly received in others. This is number one. Number two from uh, the archaeological thing, it's very difficult because uh, one of the sites that I showed is Bubastis, Telebasta. Del Basta in uh, the Delta, in the east of the Delta. 
And maybe I can show the, just the, the rooms of, sorry, it's so many. Okay, maybe I'll, ah, here. You see? So this is a, a, a field, a huge field of uh, blocks, but this is also can be anything else. It can be an earthquake. I mean, you have to ask the archaeologists, uh, the Egyptologists who are studying this temple, what are the reasons. What we know from um, um, Sozomenos, uh, Sozomenos, one of the church historians, he said that. He said that he was shown, or people of that place of Hermopolis, they showed him or they show every visitor fallen statues and uh, destroyed. Today, of course, you cannot make the relation between uh, what Suzumino said in the fourth century. It would be very difficult, I mean, or not serious, uh, if you try to prove it <laughs> archaeologically and historically speaking. Yes? I have a question. Yes. But the only way to find the uh, traces in the Roman census. And they went, when they went to uh, Bethlehem, it was for that purpose, right? They went for the census. Uh, I, I personally, I don't know if there is a, a record of that census uh, uh, today. Maybe if someone knows better about the Roman period can tell me. Yeah. Yeah, no, there, there's no record. There's no record. And, and furthermore, that the gospel report of the census, not the way Romans would do census under uh -huh. any circumstances. I thought there was a record in Syria, in the New Kingdom of Syria. Oh, you can have plenty of uh, like uh, false or replicas. Or if the historians of that period says that there is no, means that, yeah, because it's a very uh, important element in the history of Jesus as a man or human, or his life on earth, to have uh, like real facts about his life. We have time for a couple more. Let's here. Um, are there significant Jewish communities along the Nile at that time? Yes, absolutely. And um, we know that from from different sources, and the biggest diaspora was in Alexandria, for sure. And, and, and sorry? Yes, they did. This is what we know from the, the homily of uh, Theophilus, that they went especially there because there was also a group, and that is true. We know that Hermopolis had a large Jewish community that lived even I would say perhaps even after the Arab conquest, they were still living there. We have traces of information about them. So that was not unusual to find Jews in Egypt. Well, I appreciate the fact that you have just given me fungible uh, evidence yeah. uh, very professionally. Uh, the question is, we heard, we read that there is no um, uh, Mm -hmm. the other side, in Israel, as well as uh, the church in general is open to a spiritual reading of uh, some uh, events, not necessarily to be historical, but to be theological, mm -hmm. to be allegorically compared, for example, in this event, to uh, the, the history of Joseph in Egypt and his return from there. Yeah. When you were, when you were mm, under the tree, the tree, just that was maybe uh, significant that he was hidden there. Uh -huh. But still, uh, we didn't hear, hear that there is any evidence historically or scientifically, as if there is no uh, historical evidence about Jonah in my original city. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Thank you. Dr. Bruchos, this has been a wonderful presentation. It Thank has, you. It has expanded our horizons, and uh, you have done I just, fascinating research. I want to say one last word, and it's uh, ad I'm addressing here all the people from uh, Coptic or an Egyptian origin. Uh, I want to say that you should be proud of your heritage. We have a wonderful history and we should all learn more and more about the history. And I see uh, uh, people like Mina and, and I'm sure there are plenty others. I don't know everybody here in this room uh, from that church. <coughs> we keep on the good work and uh, thank you Abuna for hosting this uh, wonderful evening and please do more and more of that not to invite me personally <laughs> but to invite more more serious people than me <laughs> yeah? because our history is really full of wonderful things thank you very much, thank you very much.